Welcome to Cancer and Peace. And uh, my name is Sean Stewart. It's my good friend, Peter Scalzo. And we're here for another episode to talk about a practice that we think will help in the journey of peace. It's something that you've applied in your life. It's something I try to practice in my own life. And I think it's something that is hard to practice. So it's a discipline, mm. um, but it's, it's one of the pathways to peace. And so mm-hmm. we're going to kick off on something that we call silence and solitude. Mm-hmm. Sounds boring because it's quiet and nothing's going on, I guess. Uh, how does it strike you initially when you heard it and, and think about it now? Yeah, I mean, really, it, uh, well, it sounds impossible for me. Yeah. Uh, because I never one was one who could really sit still. I had struggled with that. And to go to a place where I'm supposed to be kind of clear out my thoughts and all that, I thought, wow, I don't know what place that is. And I guess um, I, I'll introduce just for myself, because within the spiritual practices that I do, Silence and solitude is is one of the tools, and I'd put it under the umbrella of self care. And I, I think one of the issues, uh, when at least for me, when I was diagnosed with cancer, uh, I really did not practice good self care. Uh, hmm. I really extended myself. I was working constantly. I was volunteering constantly. I was a busy lawyer in a busy church and a busy family, six children. Uh, you know, just there, I was overextended in so many different areas. And it wasn't until I was diagnosed with cancer and started to go through that journey that the concept of self-care even became like an idea for me. I thought I could just pour myself out constantly without then exercising self-care. And I found out, especially as the cancer journey kept going, going, I'll be going into my 19th year this this year. But as the journey kept going and going, and I was not taking the time to process uh, grieving and trauma and my emotional life, I was like, I was a very unhealthy guy. Hmm. And um, and so we've talked about that, the story of of what happened, especially for me in the in the sense of, uh, getting in touch with myself emotionally, give myself permission to feel God talking through my feelings. What do I do with those feelings, those emotions, especially the tough ones, fear, anger, and sadness? We've we've talked about that, but I think a big part of self care for me was stepping into and exploring silence and so- solitude, um, especially when it comes down to my cancer journey. I have a PET scan Monday. We call something scanxiety mm-hmm. within the cancer space, and no matter how many you've had, that test is specifically to look for cancer. So it's uh, for a cancer patient. You don't just waltz in there with you know. You, you have to actually purposefully go after seek peace for that test. You know, um, but I think in the silence and solitude space you have you and i explored it together mm-hmm. and you really went into the silence and solitude space silence and solitude is something that i try to do i would say 5 days a week awesome yeah so it is a discipline and a practice yeah um i want to talk a bit on the concept i got introduced to this um not from recovery but from the work of Pete Scazzaro, we started into emotionally healthy spirituality. Emotionally healthy spirituality. I can't even say this today. But as we delved into that a little bit, which has a lot of great concepts that are similar to recovery concepts about becoming emotionally healthy. And Scazzaro really got to, he put out a lot of principles and thoughts related to it. But the the thing that struck me was that he viewed this part of his journey as almost um, a third epiphany, meaning like the, a third great conversion in his life. And so the first one was literally coming to faith in a God. Um, the second one was, uh, I'm going to call it his inner journey or hitting the wall and seeing his emotional brokenness. And his third one being this journey, of the, uh, the silent land kind of journey. And, and he started some practices in emotionally healthy spirituality where you would sit down and just do two minutes of silence. And, Mm -hmm. and so if you were to, if you're sitting at home or somewhere, if you can stop whatever you're doing 
and for two minutes be silent and then ask yourself and see what's going on inside is just the starting point for this is what is going on inside and you're going to find out there's a lot going on inside if you've never done this before there's a lot going on inside and you and I were at the uh, business and lunching, the Christian business business and lunching over in Danbury um, this last weekend. We got to hear Pastor John talk about his hitting the wall moment, and and I'm gonna actually going to define that again because I just thought he did such a, such a great job of this. And if you're in a cancer journey, you're likely going through what we would call the wall, and the wall is like where major trauma, um, large life events happen. And it causes you to have to stop and stop and ask questions and it stops you in your tracks. But he defined the wall in the, I'm going to call it in the personal or in the spiritual realm as when the person you want to be or the person you're trying to be is stopped and the person that you really are catches up to them. Mm -hmm. And man, that just struck me as like, this is, that's the real thing there. It's like when when the person that you actually are inside catches up to the person that you're trying to be. And I'm, I'm going to call that your false self. So when your false self hits the wall, the person you really are catches up to them. And, and, and you have options at that point, you can embrace your real self and take the journey. That's why we call it the journey through the wall uh, with your real self. And that means like this discovery of who am I really, what, what am I holding on inside? What's my, anxieties, fears, um, what are my character defects? All these kind of things just are worked in the wall. Or I can choose to try to run away again. It's like I can try to throw that real self aside and go back. We call that bouncing off the wall and maybe going back to something else, uh, getting busy, um, being getting involved in something else that distracts me from being able to see and, and engage with my real self. And this is such a big concept, the wall, because the wall is what is usually what gets people to start working on what I'm going to call their inner journey. And silence and solitude is a practice. Once you recognize that you want to go down this road of I'm going to take an inner journey is this practice of first awareness, like the first step in it is awareness. And so uh, as I got into it from Pete Scazzaro's work and I was sharing some of those things with a good friend of uh you you and my you and I um, <coughs> Andrew had a friend of his and this friend is Andrew he had a friend of his that uh, had sent him a work he's like hey are you ready for some graduate level stuff and and he was giggling so he he sent it to me and um, and it turns out uh, I read it and I read it just I just digested it in in almost one setting um, just really quickly and then I found I went back again but I would call it graduate level work in this area this person who wrote about um, and it's, the work is uh, Into the Silent Land by Martin Laird. And he really did a great job of defining what's going on inside of us mm -hmm. as we take this journey uh, into the silent land and what that journey is about. And, and you defined awareness um, as an important thing. And you said something early on, and I want to just go back to it. And that was, um, have you ever tried to clear your mind? And I want to say that the practice of silence and solitude is not the act of clearing our minds. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that not to, uh, to be corrective, but more in a sense of, I think a lot of people will say, I'm going to try to, with a much effort to get my mind to a clear state. Mm -hmm. And Laird really helped me see that it's not about trying to get my mind to a clear state. It's literally a lot of my mind is processing the things. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the place of silence and solitude is that um, I start seeing the processes and I process them faster and faster and faster. Mm. And it's as if those things that want to afflict me, those thoughts about, you know, um, you know, being bald or whatever it is, you know, just the, the things that are coming at me at such a speed that um, I can process them where I don't need to focus on those anymore, meaning that once they're processed, I can allow my mind to get past all the, the noise. And he looks at it and he talks about it as if the noise that's coming into your brain is as if it's clouds hitting a great mountain. Mm. I thought that was such a great description because it's, mm -hmm. the whole idea of silence and solitude is to become aware of the mountain, of who you are, like the real, meaningful, deeper part of you. Mm -hmm. And those things that are hitting the mountain, they're just clouds. Mm. And once you're able to process the clouds, and those are clouds down there, 
that's a cloud, that's a cloud, that's a cloud, and let the clouds drift by, mm-hmm. you can start looking at the deeper side of you, if, but there's a mountain here. Mm-hmm. And what is the real you? Mm. What's really who you are, what's going on with you, and what's really important. And the idea of silence and solitude is taking the time to sit in that place and to feel. Mm. And what I liked about Pastor John, what he did the other day is he said, I started this journey and the moment I sat down and tried to be silent, I recognized that I was so afflicted Mm. and he's a doer. And so am I. And I know that you are too. It's like Mm -hmm. when you're a, when you're a doer, your immediate implication, your your immediate desire is to get up and immediately go find something to busy yourself, to distract and this is a discipline because you're actually going to say, no, I'm going to actually sit through this mm. and I'm going to listen and I'm going to contemplate and I'm going to process and I'm going to let all that stuff be processed out until I can get to the next place in the journey. Mm. And there is another place in the journey and it's a, at a deeper level, but it's not about um, trying to clear your mind. It's literally processing and contemplating and working through that and getting really good at that Mm -hmm. because all that noise is clouds hitting a great mountain. It's just a great concept. So just give us a practical example of that in your life. How do you process? How do I process in my own life? Yeah. Well, I think every day um, I wake up with thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. And if I don't sit down and take that time um, what will happen is so as a narrative based creature, meaning that I have a narrative that the story of life is running by. So I start my day with um, this. The starting point is to feel. Mm-hmm. So I'll sit down and I won't let anything else distract me in that place. And I allow myself to feel and what are those thoughts and feelings and what's happening in those. And rather than letting the narratives that are coming through my phone or electronic device or anything else be my interpretation is I actually ask where they're really coming from. And then I allow myself to see where they're coming from and understand where they're coming from. And so uh, for me, a lot of times that's anxiety about something that's happening uh, here at the ministry Mm. or um, anxiety. Anxiety is one of the key things I have to manage for my own self. And what I recognize is that if I wake up and I don't do that practice, I'm going to manage from anxiety, meaning that I got all this stuff to do and then I'm going to start rushing And as I start rushing along to try to get all the stuff done, I'll never know why I felt anxiety to begin with. And most of the time it's because I don't trust. So for me, the narrative would be, do I trust God with today that he's actually has it in control or do I have to find all the key pieces and solve them as if it's a puzzle and work through all the details of that? Mm-hmm. and make all the right contacts and do all those things that I would do in my power. And so it's an exercise of recognizing that I struggle with trust. Mm. It would be an example of that. And so once I identify the anxiety and I allow myself to process it and I recognize, no, that's just coming from a narrative. Those mm-hmm. are just clouds. That anxiety is representing something mm-hmm. and it's representing something much deeper. And that is, um, I don't trust And then the moment I can get to trust, I can let go of the anxiety Mm -hmm. and I can realize, but I actually have to, to use a different narrative to do that. I actually have to, to process that there is a real narrative and I've been listening to a false narrative. So you're by yourself, you're processing these feelings, anxiety also. um, And that's, what's the silence part for you, the solitude, the silence. Is there a time where you're just listening? Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think the whole time is is listening, but it's starting with listening to your uh, body and allowing your mind to work through everything. And then there's a point where um, as you allow all that to process out, um, I'm going to call it as a place of peace. Mm Mm-hmm. And the place of peace is when you've uh, processed all the narratives and rightly aligned your story to reality the mm-hmm. best the best that you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a place of peace. And that is something that 
I'm going to describe that. And the best way I know how to describe that, it, it would be like sitting um, at your favorite place mm-hmm. with somebody you really love. Mm-hmm. There's no need for words. Mm. So, but um, so I guess that's one of the uh, issues for me is when I, tr- when I get into that place, which is in the mornings for me. Yeah of silence and solitude, I have to process people and places and things kind of thing, but I have to process, um, like you said, those feelings, emotions, anxieties, whatever it is. And um, benevolent detachment is helpful to me to mm-hmm. let it go. Yep. And I like clouds against, I, I like to picture a train and I put people on that train and I wave to them goodbye. You know, I pray for them, but I put them on the train yeah. or situations. This and is the it's way gone. you're processing those relationships. Yeah, it yes. goes. And I'm like, see you later. And yeah. those aren't yours to hold on to. Right, yes. right. So it's this letting go, including cancer and uh, my health issues, my future, finances, children. Lord, these these are, I've let everyone and everything go to you, Jesus. I surrender it to you. Yeah, you're in details. That's good. So that I like yeah. this idea of. You're talking about, hey, as that afflicting thought comes, yes, uh, whether it be cancer or, um, you know, a fight with your spouse or yep. whatever it is, you know, a relationship that's there, it is once I've processed it, mm-hmm. I can let go of it. Meaning, and processing yeah. means, okay, for whatever part of my journey is, and let's say it's cancer, um, mm-hmm. God, I'm going to give this to you. I know that I can't control my cancer journey. So there's right. a physical saying, I'm going to release that to you. And so the right. next moment when that cancer thought, thought tries to come back, then it can just go by. I can, it's right. like, I processed that. I, I've already, I've just released that. I don't need to reprocess that. Um, and as I think about the different people, it's like, hey, I've taken time to think about my relationship with Joe. And mm-hmm. with Joe, um, I know that this is what's going on here. And I know where I'm going to go with that or what I need to do or whether I need to make amends or whatever. I've processed it. I'm going to let go of that. I don't need to so, process. I don't need to go any further this moment. With right. This. Um, and I, I do that for myself too. I do an inventory of myself, yes. character defects, sins, where I'm at, and I process them too. Mm-hmm. So I guess what I meant about clearing my mind is I've processed all those things. I've put them on a train. They're yes. in God's hands. So then I turn to usually just saying, Abba, Father. Yes. And I, tr- I try to be in a place of listening. And usually I'm pretty clear to listen. And these are different practices. So I'll, let's talk yeah. about that for yeah, a second. Yeah. Because um, a concept that I'll put out there, and mm-hmm. as we do, and we've I've done two of those here, at our organization here uh, for outside groups where we've done silence and solitude retreats or uh, times. And uh, we've had people here for events and we've taught on this. And I'm always fascinated by this is that uh, we will go back to, and I'll say, Hey, we're um, we'll send people out on exercise to experiment with this, uh, you know, sitting in silence and solitude with the tools that we give them. And, and we'll talk about tools here in a few minutes, but um Almost to a person, they'll come back, well, well, this is what I heard from God. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. Um, I think that is part of the process. Like one of the riddles uh, and one of the parts of the journey is moving from clearing uh, your mind. There's a listening side and then there's the being side. And so I jumped all the way to the end of the greatest part of relationship is when you're in such a deep relationship with somebody is that you don't need a word from them at all. You literally can just be in their presence. And so Mm -hmm. to experience presence with God, I think is one of the higher forms of prayer is just to be in presence and not need to say anything. And so if you think about, um, there's a great story in the Bible about uh, Jesus coming to the Mount of Transfiguration and you have Moses and Elijah shows up with them and you have, um, I think it was Peter, James and John, uh, they were there and Peter starts speaking. He's like, Hey, uh, we're going to build booths here and memorials. And he's talking and uh, you know, and it's like, what say you, you know, in a sense, it's like, and I think, you know, God's like to be in his presence. Like you got to experience something that was incredibly glorious mm. 
and our, our, our impulsive natural desires to need to say something or to feel like it's a dialogue. Mm. Um, but I think the, what I think to be in the South is the highest form of this is to sit in the presence and just experience love. And, um, I, I heard this, um, I've been kind of delving into this concept, the soul of shame, uh, book that I had connected on. And, and there's this, there's this exercise that he does for people and he asks them to face each other and put their knees together, especially this for married couples. Do not say a word and gaze for five minutes, gaze in each other's eyes. And I want you to think loving thoughts of connection that you, uh, together, just, you don't need to say a word. I want you to look at that person and to gaze loving, you know, just feel and think about the loving thoughts and, the. Uh, the, the things of affection that would be on your mind mm. and transformative without words, because we experience more in the nonverbal than in the words. And I think, uh, the whole point of silence and solitude is to build that level of connection with God that we can feel that peace. Yeah. without words. And so, so I think, uh, you're describing stages and I think that's good. It's like there's stages of first it's, I don't want to use the word clearing, but I think it's, it's processing and yes, there's, and processing. by processing, it's, it's bringing clarity to what's important and yes. like what's where you're really at. And so that point of getting to, um, seeing yourself as you really are and not having the distractions of all the clouds or all the noise or all mm -hmm. the life's problems, becoming the key thing. And so, um, it's a form of prayer that moves past all the, all the noise items. So that I need to, you know, uh, God help me with my bills and help me with the car that mm -hmm. needs to be repaired. And all that is processing all that, but it's moving to getting to here. I am mm. in my naked vulnerability. Here I am. Mm -hmm. And you become aware of here I am in your vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And, I think in that place, sometimes we hear words from God mm -hmm. and they're usually words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. I love you. I'm mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. uh, these types of words. And so that's a great place to be. Mm -hmm. And then there's a state of, can we just be together? Mm. And let's just sit here in that peaceful place of relationship that doesn't require words. Mm -hmm. Think about our performance-based thinking society and the concept of just sitting with God like that. Yes. Enjoying each other's company only. That's a, that's an interesting, you know, that's it's a tough one. so interesting uh, to me because whenever I, cause you know, we're involved in a ministry here, Christian based ministry. And whenever we say let's pray or uh, we're going to pray, it's always uh, this idea of, well, let's get requests. Let's get our list of needs and wants and let's verbalize those. And God knows all those. And it's not wrong to do that. Um, and it's important that we do bring this. There's even, you know, precedent in scripture to, to bring your needs before God. There's something humbling about that. But rarely do we get to the point of, hey, can we sit here together mm -hmm. in God's presence and allow our minds to, and our understanding of who we are as a people, as God's people. And if we can get to that place, could we literally set, set and enjoy his presence? Mm. And so I'm not the least bit surprised when we do a silence and solitude retreat mm -hmm. that you don't get to that place in, mm -hmm. um, a retreat or a one setting. Mm hmm um, in fact, I think that's why we talk about every day is like, this is a discipline to right. just to learn how to process your own thoughts and feelings, yeah. uh, to let the clouds become clouds again, um, to know who you are. That's a discipline. There's a, there's a couple of trauma exercises that I do before mine to that it's breathing, but it's also grounding myself mm -hmm. and, and some, some other tools that are helpful for me to get me in just sort of a state of re relaxation and sort of processing that trauma and then going into this time. But it's such a, an opposite to our culture. I mean, the fact that you would take this time out of your day to process your thoughts, process everything going on inside of you, process yourself, 
and then enter into a place of complete, <coughs> excuse me, silence and listening and being with God. Because it does take time. Yeah, I think that's the kind of the order of those three. It's, uh, it's, and it is so countercultural, counterintuitive. I start with um, processing, then I, then I'm in listening, and then I'm in being. And those doors don't always open. You know, I like the the way Laird describes it. Um, and he said there's multiple. Like these are, those aren't the only three. Uh, there's more. Yeah. Um, but he describes it as three doors. And as you yeah. walk through these three doors, you find another layer of something that's there. Uh, but there's, it's three just as a way of understanding it, but there's thousands mm-hmm. of these in, in this. Um, but this place uh, that you're talking about is, hey, you're being asked by the culture and the world around you to run yourself ragged, to be the end all be all, to be self-made men and women, uh, to solve your problems, to be in control. And this is the exact opposite of saying, no, let go of it all. Mm-hmm. Don't just drop it, process it and release it to God. Process and release it, process and release it. Mm-hmm. And then once you recognize it's been released, you don't need to re- re-grab hold of it. Your mind's going to try to re-grab hold of it. So, no, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. And then right. you're going to go, hey, God, what do you have for me? Right. Yeah, and... There's opportunities as cancer patients to do it. Like for the PET scan I have Monday, there's an, they inject the glucose and then they, there's like an hour of silence Mm -hmm. and darkness. They, they put you in a room and you're not allowed to look at your cell phone or anything. Actually, it's a perfect time to do the science and solitude journey, having a PET scan. It's interesting. um, You talked earlier about some of the skills that um, we've learned both from some of the trauma training we've done. And I found that I'm super sensitive to what I hear. And so uh, you can go through and kind of test that a little bit by what senses um, and what you, like what is your primary nervous system tool for danger as an example. And Mm so um, I, when I go into silence, I can actually tell you, every detail about the sounds that are my house makes every detail. I mean, to the smallest thing, how uh, quick the compressor is scrolling and cycling on uh, the mini split to, you know, (laughs) some water running for the cat's bowl to every little detail I can hear. And that's because I'm super sensitive to that's my, my nervous system does that. Mm -hmm. But I have to process that because when I hear something that's slightly um, different, Mm -hmm. Um, my nervous system is sending me a signal that there might be danger and I have to go, I have to look, I have to see what's going on. And I say that only as an example of our entire lives, this is happening in the subconscious. Mm. And the moment I move it to the conscious, then I have to process that down to, to be in silence. I actually need some silence. I need a place of silence, but I, Mm -hmm. not everybody can have perfect silence. You can't get to perfect silence. And so then you have to actually take time to, to know what's safe and you're creating a safe environment for yourself to, to be able to sit in presence and, and those things that might be distractions, your mind's already going to know what it is and the why it's there and you can move past that. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're, our, bodies are incredibly complex. We're going to be trying to figure out what's dangerous. Yeah. Um, what's coming my way and Mm -hmm. what's a distraction. Mm -hmm. And so you have to process every one of those things Mm -hmm. to allow yourself to get to this place where it's clouds. Uh, those are clouds, you know, and I'm just going to say, this is a choice to do this kind of spiritual practice. And, but God, I I believe God knows it's of high value for us. I mean, he says, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 23, he leads me beside still waters. Mm -hmm. Jesus escaped many times into silent prayer, silence and solitude away from the everyone Mm -hmm. to try to get away. So um, I know that this is at the heart of God too, to, to, be still and know that he is God. One of the best practices, I think that's why Scazzaro Mm -hmm. talked about it as his third kind of conversion, epiphany, spiritual journey was this very reason. And I think uh, my, my 
own journey tells me that it is at that level um, in a similar way that, but it's not a quick fix. It's not an easy journey. It's one of those practices that there's great joy in, but you have to start and then you're going to yeah, be. And I, how I describe it for cancer patients or <clears throat> is that of all the things I do on this earth that prepare me for an eternity with Jesus, silence and solitude is the, is the main thing. <laughs> that's that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I think people might think that, hey, it's boring or whatever. Yeah. At first, what you're going to find is that it's hard. Yeah. Um, and that the the discipline of kind of letting that uh, processing is hard work. Mm -hmm. And it's not uh, for the faint at heart in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you keep going down this road a little bit, you're going to find that it's incredibly rewarding mm -hmm. and relaxing. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of techniques that we'll go into uh, that you can go into. I'm going to yeah. throw one thing out there that yeah. um, is a tool that, that uh, is put out there. If you're going to do silence and solitude, um, start out with something, a prayer word or a prayer phrase. Yeah. And um, a prayer word or a prayer phrase for me, it can be just Jesus. Mm. You said Abba earlier. Um, um, there's all kinds of them that are out there. It can be a small phrase. Um, it could be love. Um, but have that prayer word. And what it is, is it's a, your mind is immediately, once you start down this road, it's going to just race in a hundred directions. But it's, mm. um, Laird calls it, you know, it's like uh, the vaccine. You're giving a small dose of the problem to refocus um, and move your mind back to what you're trying to do. And so mm -hmm. whenever you have a prayer word and if it's Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, it's a way to refocus your mind. It's as if you're vaccinating it from all the other things that are happening out there. Mm -hmm. And yes, you're introducing a small dose of noise into your mind, but it's a focusing noise mm -hmm. and it's about focusing. And eventually once you get to the place where you see the clouds as clouds, uh, that word can drop away, but it's just a way of helping to focus you in, uh, that you're in a practice and you can keep repeating that. And mm -hmm. it's a way of, of allowing yourself to know where are you trying to go? Also, there's a point to this. And I, so I, I just give that out there as just a, a starting point as a yeah. prayer word or a prayer phrase mm -hmm. that really will help focus your mind. And then, uh, you can go into this journey and there's just, this is much deeper than we're ever going to cover in a, in a short podcast, you know, mm -hmm. one episode here, but I think we should, we wanted to introduce it to you because as a practice, it's a way of releasing control and learning how to find peace because this is about cancer and peace. And so if right. you're in a cancer journey, as we mentioned before, you're in the middle of a wall journey. Right. And if you're going to find peace, um, finding who you really are, are what the real narrative is, is what's really going on. What's the purpose? What's the point? Mm -hmm. uh, and then being able to trust and be in the presence of the one who loves you the most is that's a place of great peace. Amen. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate that. Well, I think we'll call that a wrap for today. And uh, if you want to get more resources, go to cancerandpeace.com and you'll find a lot more there. You'll find uh, even links to where I got kicked off with the uh, emotionally and healthy spirituality, uh, Pete and Jerry's work there and several other items. So uh, we look forward to uh, hearing or having you be a part of that in future podcasts. Thanks a bunch. Thank you.